Hey, good morning, friends. Yes, sir. It's Sunday morning, podcast time with Brother Mike. It's 9 o'clock Pacific time. It's 9 o'clock in Arizona. It's noon on the East Coast. And uh, thank you for uh, turning, tuning in. Welcome to my shut-ins. We love you. Got a good Bible study for you today. Got another one, good one for you. Really worth listening to. Uh, please remember all of our wonderful services at the Deliverance Center. We just had a children's deliverance service. We have them once a month. It's usually on the first Saturday of the month at 10 o'clock. They are just fantastic. You wouldn't believe the number of kids getting healed and delivered in these services. It's very heartwarming. We have two live services every week, Thursday and Friday nights at 7 o'clock. Brother Rick smashes Grand Slams on Thursday night. He's fantastic. He knows more about the spirit world than uh, five guys put together on YouTube. So uh, he should have a huge number of people listening to him. He's freaky. He's an odd speaker like I am. You know, uh, neither of us have a lot, a lot of uh, cross-sectional glorious appeal to people. But uh, if you can get past our presentation, I'll tell you what, the material is uh, fantastic. It really is. And uh, usually God seekers like us, uh, casual Christians do not. Thursday, Friday night, seven o'clock, two services live at the Arizona Deliverance Center on 15th Avenue, just south of Osborne Road. It's a red brick building, as I tell you every week. When you go to work Monday through Friday, you can catch me on the radio, 1010 AM Christian Radio. You can also catch me on Sunday afternoon and Saturday afternoon. The schedule's on the homepage of the website, hardcorechristianity.com. We got Zoom services, and they are so annoying. It's, it's ridiculous. Mondays is for the ladies. Wednesday and Saturday is for everybody. You can send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you all the information about the services. Tuesdays. Uh, Julie is teaching a class on the book I wrote, Plan of Spirits, The Root Cause and Cure of Mental Illness, every Tuesday. That's at 6.30. Her Zoom is Mondays at 6.30. The other two Zooms, Wednesday and Saturday, are 6 o'clock Pacific and Arizona time. So I hope you'll take advantage of those things and invite somebody to the Zoom that's the most important thing. Find somebody who needs to be healed or delivered and uh, invite them to the services. That's the best thing to do. That's why we have the services, so we can uh, reach as many people as we you know, possibly can. You can contact me at mike at hardcorechristianity.com, and I answer 100% of my emails, even the bad ones or the critical ones. Very happy to hear what you have to say, positive or negative. Please remember to order the Miracle List, step-by-step -step guide to healing and deliverance that works 100% of the time. You've got to have that. One is for troubled Christians. The other one is for mentally ill Christians. If you have an anxiety disorder, clinical depression, bipolar, whatever it is, you can get a copy of the Miracle List and go through the steps, and you can be healed and delivered let's take a hard target look at the word of god today wow if you go to luke chapter 22 i mean this thing is a bombshell this thing is a lightning strike it's unbelievable how powerful this chapter in the bible is it's one of the most powerful chapters anywhere old or new testament it is jesus's uh last day with his disciples before he's arrested. And he's got to get this last minute information through because he's not going to be with them much longer. He's going to be arrested and murdered. So Jesus goes through a series of instructions with the disciples, knowing this is the end, the last supper, the whole deal. And as you remember, he goes through servanthood, which is the height of being a Christian. 
it's not the five offices in the church that is the greatest for Christians. You got the apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and so on. Those things there are secondary to the number one spot in Christianity, which is being a servant. And so Jesus illustrates that for them by washing their feet. And he explains to them that to be a leader in Christianity and to be great in the kingdom of God, the number one office to hold is an apostle or a prophet or pastor. It's being a servant. Then he goes on to explain to them, look, remember when I sent you out two by two? Yeah. You remember you, you didn't take anything with it. Remember that? Yes. You know, all your needs were met. Remember that? Yes. Now Jesus says, we're going to change it. I'm going to be gone now. So now when you go out to do missions work, prepare, take supplies, plan ahead. You wouldn't believe how many people over the years that I have counseled, it's really a shocking number, who have had their ministries destroyed because they didn't know how to interpret the Bible. Okay? Here's how you interpret the Bible. Never forget this as long as you live. The way you interpret the Bible is you read all the texts in every book, in every chapter, in every verse, literally. Take it literally. Where figurative language is used in verses, chapters, books, look for the literal meaning the figurative language is trying to display. If you will, if you will keep those two things in your mind when looking at the scripture, you'll almost never get involved in false doctrines. Number three, you have to look at the word of God in context. Because if you take the scripture out, you will be creating a false doctrine. And that's what TV preachers do. They have an agenda like a politician and so they want to have these scriptures fulfill that agenda so they'll pull them out of context and they'll throw it at you like mud on a wall hoping something sticks that's not how you study the word of god and that's not how you avoid giving off on false doctrines you have to read the bible in context the, the entirety of the text and so today we're going to go over the garden of gethsemane but we have to look at it in context. And in the context of it, Jesus is giving the disciples his last series of instructions before he's arrested. And he gives them the good news and the bad news. He tells them good news. He says, uh, I have preserved a kingdom for you. We will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you will be in glory. And you, disciples, will be um, in charge of each tribe of Israel. The nation of Israel will be restored. There will be 12 gates on the New Jerusalem. And you'll be supervising every one of them. There's the good news. The bad news is I'm going to get murdered, butchered, arrested. You people are going to abandon me. Judas is going to betray me. I'm going to be murdered in cold blood. The bad news, Simon, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you. After you backslide, after you fail, after you turn your back on me, come home. That's exactly what happened. Then he told Simon he was going to deny him. Everybody heard it. The whole group. The Last Supper. He said, not only you, Simon, 
all of you are going to forsake me. You're all leaving. Hell is coming to breakfast. So human nature, the way we were born in sin, the way we we're built, here's how humans do it. If you give them a bunch of good news and then a bunch of bad news, human beings will, by nature, genetically drift over to the bad news. It's in our nature. Only when the person becomes a true born-again Christian, receives the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, and renews their mind on the Word of God, is this old man, so to speak, taken out and executed. The old man needs to be shotgunned in the head. Just die. So naturally, the disciples heard all of these horrible things. They didn't hear the good things. The kingdom of heaven is theirs, the new Jerusalem, their wonderful future. They didn't hear that. They heard all these horrible, I'm going to fail you. We're all going to forsake you. You got to be kidding. So the disciples, after the Last Supper, are now down in the dumps. Judas ran off. He had had enough. And he ran off to, to betray the Lord and stab him in the back. Let's go to verse 39 in Luke chapter 22. That's our text today. In the context of what I just shared. Got to read the Bible in context. Don't pull verses out and throw them at people. Verse 39. Jesus came out. And as was his custom, he went to the Mount of Olives. That was his favorite place. And you should have a favorite place too. Do you have uh, some place that you kind of sneak over and do your devotionals? Uh, I do. I, I live on a, a lake in uh, Sun City, Arizona. And I go out in the mornings, sometimes very early. I just sit there staring at the lake and I have my devotional time. Do you have a place where you can go to have devotionals where you feel comfortable and you kind of relax a little, kind of getting away from your insane family, your deranged coworkers, your whacked out church people. You have a place to go where you can kind of relax and enjoy yourself and settle down and get your mind right and refocus on your devotional time. Do you have that? Well, I hope you do. Jesus had it and he set the example for it. He loved to go to the Mount the Mount of Olive Trees. That's what that means in Greek, olive trees. It was right near the walls of Jerusalem. It wasn't that far. And his disciples followed him. Now remember the disciples, verse 39, they're down in the dumps because they focused on the bad, not the good. That's human nature. Once you renew your mind on the word of God, once you get the Holy Ghost, you're able to break that curse that Adam put on all of us, and you're able to now develop the mind of Christ. But they hadn't done it yet. They were still Adam's disciples, and they all crashed. And Jesus was at the place, and he said to them, pray that you enter not into temptation. Now here, here is the context of the text. Remember this. Uh, parasmos is the Greek word for temptation. It means to be put to the test, to put, to, to prove yourself. Prove it. Jesus said, pray that you enter not into temptation. Why did he say that? Because at that time, the context of the text, they were down in the dumps. When you get down in the dumps, when you go down and you're feeling low, and your mind's filled with negative thoughts, and they're affecting your emotions negatively, you are very susceptible to Satan tempting you and attacking you. So Jesus is saying here, while you're down in the dumps and you're, not, and you're unhappy and you're sad, that's an opening for demonic attacks. Pray that you enter not into your testing period. Pray that it doesn't happen. Because you're down in the dumps and haven't renewed your mind. Verse 41. And it says he, he left them. And remember, he only took his big three there. 
Who is that? James, Peter, John. They were the only ones that got to go with him into the depths of the of the Garden of Gethsemane. The other ones stayed on the outside. And it says he kneeled down and prayed. And he said, Father, if you be willing, remove. Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now here you see your salvation was bought and paid for on Calvary and guaranteed in the resurrection of Christ, but it was actually won in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here's where Jesus won our salvation when he uttered these words and the devil and the most powerful demons he had available were in the garden with him. They were attacking him. You've got to understand something that 24 seven, you are being stalked by demons and that will not stop until you're dead and removed to glory. It never goes away. Oppression, attacks from the outside are something that come from demons to Christians and it never changes or stops, so to speak. Everyone is subject to being attacked and subject to oppression. Not everyone is required to be infected or possessed by demons. That is not required. But oppression, it never stops. It happened to the Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived, to the moment he was executed as a martyr. They murdered him in cold blood for preaching the good news of Christ. It never stops. It does stop in glory when you go there for your rewards and your judgment. But right here is where our salvation was won when Jesus said, Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Now, here's the key to it all. If you had any desire at all to, I hate to use this word because it's a terrible word to use. If you want to be special to God, okay? And again, I'm qualifying that term. It's a, it's a rotten term. Special meaning used with the moving of the spirit, used with the intimate dunamis power of God and very few Christians ever just a tiny number of Christians ever become disciples and ever get the powerful moving of the spirit very very few the vast majority 98 percent never get there but I'm asking you would you by any chance have an interest in being in the two percent the two percent of Christians who have the anointing and the power of God is that any interest of yours? If it is, you have to follow this example. You've got to go to the garden. And the garden is when you reach that moment where you no longer matter and you have quit serving yourself and you are a broken, broken person. Everybody who wants to get into, to use this term, again, it's a bad one, holy of holies. The holy of holies is that 2% of Christians get into that little section where the moving of the spirit and the power of God is a common reality. It's common. Okay? But nobody can get there until they have gone to the garden. And Jesus could not pay for our sins on Calvary until he won our salvation in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus said, Father, you can do everything. I know you can do anything. Take this cup from me. Take it away. Why? Because Jesus suffered more than any human being in history not just because of the physical torture and his obvious murder, but because the sins of the world were loaded upon him before his death. And that 
caused agony no human being has ever suffered. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment for our peace was upon him. And that's why by his stripes we are healed. Jesus suffered more than any man ever has because the physical torture was bad, but many human beings have been tortured physically over the years. But the spiritual torture was beyond belief because it got so bad, the Holy Ghost left him. And Jesus cried out on the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? The horror of what Jesus had become. He became our sin. Was beyond Father's ability to look at him anymore. He couldn't, he couldn't do it. When Jesus said nevertheless, that was the worst word the devil ever heard. He never heard a word more painful than that. He had him. Take this cup from me. The devil was rejoicing in the garden, standing there high five and some fallen angel or something. But when he heard these words, nevertheless, he loaded his depends overflowing. Not my will, but thine be done. You must go to the garden and surrender your will. There's no other way. You want to be in the 2%? Go. Go to the garden. You have to do it. And these attacks from Satan in the garden and the pain and the agony and the emotional pain he was suffering was so astronomical that an angel, verse 43, had to come and strengthen him to get through it. That's how bad it was. I've been through, through some bad trials in my life, and I'm sure you have. I never had an angel appear in my room trying to help me out because I never suffered as bad as Jesus, not even close. An angel had to come and strengthen him, verse 43. And then verse 44, agonia is where we get our English word agony. He was suffering emotionally, agonia, to suffer emotional pain. In agony, it says, he prayed more earnestly and suddenly sweat like great drops of blood. A thrombus, the Greek word for great drops there is thrombus, and it means a blood clot. He was in such hideous agony mentally and emotionally, and the stress was so great from the satanic attacks upon him in the garden that he had blood clots coming out of his forehead, his skull, wherever they were. And there was these clots were so heavy they clunk, they would drop to the ground. When he rose up from prayer, he came back to his disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. Verse 45. Now this is important. Sleeping for what? Lupe, Greek word, sadness, grief, grieving. What was happening there? The disciples were emotionally exhausted because they were focusing on all the bad things Jesus had told them prior to going to the Mount of Olives. You know, a lot of people have counseled over the years that had clinical depression. One of the symptoms of it is they sleep a lot. It's a method of demonic withdrawal. The demons tell you, hey, listen, you, if you sleep, you're going to be able to avoid all this. But the demons know that if you're sleeping all the time, you're not going to do anything for God. You're not going to be effective and you're not going to get healed. So they want you to sleep all the time. In addition to that, because you're sleeping all the time, sometimes they attack you in your dreams with bad bad dreams or nightmares. It's all a trick. It's all a process they use to 
crush human beings. In order for you to get out of the 98% and into the 2%, you're going to have to go to the garden and become a broken person. No garden, no Calvary. No Calvary, no resurrection. No resurrection, no me, no you. Are you a 2% or are you a 98%? 98% of the Christians are all in one big group. They amount to nothing, spiritually usually. Very, very weak, useless, gutless failures. 2%ers, the disciples, you know where the, how they got into that 2% group? They went to the garden. There's no way around it. Come on, friend. I love you. I'm trying to help you. See, the prophetic movement in the United States is a sham. It's just awful. Here's why. People want cheap miracles. Oh, look, there's gold dust. There, there, there's a gem on the floor. Oh, look, there's a glory cloud. Whee! They want an easy, easy fix. Let's go to the courts of heaven. All that crap all goes to the same place, 98% group. It accomplishes nothing. Cheap miracles aren't worth it. Gosh, Mike, that's kind of harsh. Uh, yeah, my whole ministry is hard. You want 2%? You want 2%? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm still, I've still got a throat thing. You want 2%? The road to the 2% goes through the garden. That's where you're going to have to go. That's where you go to die. That's where you go when it becomes not about you anymore. The fivefold offices of the church, oops, there's one greater. You know what it is? Of course you do. Being a servant, Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to rule. He came to serve. The road to the power of the Spirit. Goes through the garden. Wigglesworth went to the garden. He loved his wife so much it was unbelievable. He just uh, couldn't believe it. She was his favorite person. It was kind of like Abraham and Isaac. Uh, Wigglesworth adored his wife. She was the greatest thing in the world. He absolutely. Love the living heck out of her. I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. It was uh, love on steroids. And guess what happened? He lost his wife in the garden. She was gone. What happened after that? Wigglesworth entered the 2% and he went into the Holy of Holies. His worldwide ministry started there. Catherine Kuhlman loved her dad so much. It was unbelievable. She was a daddy's girl, huge. She loved everything about him. Just one little compliment from him. Just her heart. Loved every second of it. She's preaching at a Baptist church a couple states away from Missouri and gets word his, her dad is sick. Guess what happened? Catherine went to the garden. Her dad died.
a hundred years ago, they wrote a song called In the Garden. Remember that? I go to the garden alone where the dew is still on the rose. Yeah, there you go. I know there's a lot of envy right now all over the United States because of my ability to sing, but let's just repent of it and listen carefully. If you don't go to the garden, your Mickey Mouse Christian life will never change. And that's not what you want here. It's not what you want here. You know, you know what you want? You want to be a killer cold-blooded killer. You want the devil busted. You want to see him destroyed. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thine be done. When you go to the garden, you end. Jesus came back to see a support group, and you know what they had done? They had all developed clinical depression. They were all sleepy. They were sleeping because of all the sadness Jesus told them because their minds excluded all the positive things he told them. And that's the way human beings are. They look at the negative first, the positive later. That's why all these power of positive thinking people all make such a great living. They have these conventions. They get all this. They pump you up. The person buys the books, they study the principles, then they go out and fail. Here's how this thing works. You got to make a reservation today, and I'm asking you to do it. Verse 46, why are you sleeping, Jesus said, rise, pray that you enter not into temptation. Why do you say that? Because they were down in the dumps. Being down in the dumps is a, as preachers say, a door opening event for you getting attacked. For you getting attacked. When your mind goes negative, your emotions follow. You tank. You're tanking. That's when you need to pray. Oh my God. I don't want to go into temptation now. I'm emotionally and mentally unable to overcome it. That's why he said it. Everything Jesus said has to be taken in the context. The context of what he said has to be included. And that's what I'm doing today. I always do that every Sunday morning. I look at the text and I include the context for you. I'm just praying right now that you get sick of 98%. I hope you get tired of it. I really do. I hate to pray this prayer, but I'm going to pray that God makes you tired. of it. I'm sorry I said that. You know, I hate to have to say it. Father, you can do anything. Take this cup from me. I don't want to go through this raging hell. I don't want to be tortured by Satan, demons, fallen angels, Jews, Romans, butchered, murdered. I don't, I don't want to go through it. People don't understand that it was God manifested in the flesh. That's the mystery of godliness. It was God, a human being. And you can see him in the garden there. His humanity leaping from his soul. He was truly a human. And he suffered. So we didn't have to. I'm praying that God makes you tired of a 98 percenter. Almost all Christian, born again Christians, fall into the 98 percent group. Only 2 percent ever get into the Holy of Holies with the moving of the spirit. Catherine got in there, but she went to the garden. Wigglesworth got in there. Ooh, he went to the garden. You remember that day that that young minister asked him the secret of his power? How'd you get this massive anointing? And that young minister was expecting, you know, some kind of grandiose, like, well, I was praying and a meteor flew by me and 
15 angels jumped off and came down. They all laid their hands on me. That's what that young minister was expecting to hear. You know what he actually heard? Wigglesworth said, I am a broken, lonely man. What'd you say? I went to the garden. I went to the garden. Thank God he did. Thank God Catherine did. Thank God Sister Edder did. Sister Edder was the most anointed human being that ever lived in the United States. Did you know that? She buried all of her children but one. Sister Edder used to hold, hold meetings. She was a traveling evangelist. And did you know that entire towns got saved? They would close down the whorehouses and the bars. Everything would close. They didn't have any customers anymore because the Holy Ghost stole everybody. How'd that happen? She went to the garden, friend. She became a broken woman. See, if you're not a broken person, you have a ministry, but it's actually a fake one. It's a backup ministry. Yeah, you're in a backup ministry and don't even know it. See, God God put you in the ministry. He wants to use you. He loves you. But he had you pegged here and you ended up here. Well, just because you don't fulfill your call from God here doesn't mean he's going to abandon you here. Let me ask you something. Are you, are you running the gauntlet with your Mickey Mouse ministry or the ministry that God gave you that you know wasn't quite all you were supposed to have? Huh? Yeah. He's speaking to you right now. He's telling you, let's leave your ministry here. Let's go to the garden and then I'll take you here. When Jesus left the Garden of Gethsemane, what was the first thing that happened to him? Judas showed up with hundreds of soldiers. And he gave him the kiss of death. But actually, that kiss of death that Judas gave him was the kiss we got to live. We got a shot. And Jesus said to him, you... You betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Is that how you're going to do it? Listen, don't let the devil kiss you goodbye. Loser. Don't let, don't let that happen. Do what Catherine and Wigglesworth did. Do, do what Sister Edder did. Go to the garden. Because God's got a spot in that garden for you. He has a spot for every single born-again Christian. Period. There's a spot reserved, almost like a seat on a bus. The seat's empty right now because you haven't gone. Father, you can do anything. Take this horrible nightmare from me. Nevertheless, To this day, the devil still hears that. He still hears his echo in his ears. Nevertheless, oh, he holds his head. He shakes it like that. A bunch of fire comes out of his face. Uh, why did I have to hear that? Oh, you shouldn't have been in the Garden of Gethsemane, fool. Nevertheless, that's what you're going to say. 
well, I'm serving the Lord. You know, I, I'm doing this and that and that and this, but something down here, there's a, there's a little itch down there. There's something in your gut right down there, right down here. Saying, hey, this wasn't everything I was supposed to be. This wasn't where exactly I was supposed to be. You got a little itch down there. You got a pebble in your shoe. You got a little gnawing down there. Something's gnawing. You know, I'm really not supposed to be here. I'm going to have to go to the garden. That's where I should be. On my face in tears. After the funeral of her father, Catherine Coleman sat in the funeral parlor alone. She sat right up front. The casket was right in front of her. And she just sat there weeping. She couldn't stop. The most important person she ever knew, the best friend she ever had, the only person she ever wanted to get a wink from, a smile, a pat. Oh, her dad would pat her, and it was like she hit the Arizona lottery. $145 billion, billion trillion dollars. George, you got the right number. A pat. And she was a new person. Her garden was in that funeral parlor that day. And she said in her autobiography, that was the day I died. See, if you run into people, and we see them all the time, they come in for deliverance, and they come in and they start telling us about all the wonderful things God's doing with their life and that they're supposed to be in the ministry and God's got a call and they're good. they want to do this ministry, they want to do that ministry. And you know what the sum and substance of that is? Nothing. They're never going to do it. Let me sum it up again for you. Failure. You know why they're failing? They hadn't been to the garden. You got to go to the garden alone. You can't take anybody with you. This is between you and the Lord. Nobody else. Can you go in with me? No. Jesus went into the garden alone. He knelt and prayed. Blood clots coming out of his skull. Disciples exhausted emotionally from depression, sadness. Lupeo is the Greek word. Sorrow, it says. They fell asleep because of depression, just like people do today. They want to go to sleep and get away with it, get away from it. Stop it. I don't want to hear it. No. I'll sleep it off. No, no. Is it scary to go into the garden? Yes. Is it tough? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. Yes. Was it hard for Jesus? Oh, it was so hard. It's unbelievable. An angel had to come help him. Imagine that. It's hard to believe. You got to go to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. He's waiting for you there. Oh, I know the Bible. I studied the Bible. I got a degree. I got a certificate online. Oh, I got this and that. Find a trash can and put it in. Go to the garden. I've been doing this ministry for years. Well, I, I don't get it. Stop it and go in. Stop it and go in. If you don't, you will die in the 98%. You'll never be in the 2%. Oh, that's crazy. Now, listen to me carefully. You're not getting any younger. You're getting older, okay? You're, you're almost as old as me. You're pushing it. You've wasted so many years. It's unbelievable. It's got to stop right now. Somebody's got to stop the bloodletting. 
You're bleeding, friend. Get it stitched up. Go to the garden and get your miraculous anointing. Now, this isn't going to be a popular message, and you know, there's not going to be a lot of likes and shares on this thing. I know that. I, I get it. But I'm not looking for that. What I'm looking for is maybe one or two or three people that heard this message and said, oh, my gosh. I never went to the garden. I am not a broken person. I haven't cried in 15 years. I don't know what's wrong with me. I do. You never went to the garden. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You go to the garden alone. You lose your will. You got to go. I'll see you next time. Love you.